The strange but true story featured on this podcast contains details some people may find unsettling. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Chaya Samuel and things are about to get weird. Hi, welcome to the very first episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. This is a podcast dedicated to some of the strangest stories you're ever likely to hear. The kind of stories that once you hear them, you just know you're going to have to retell them to someone else because you couldn't possibly keep something that weird to yourself. If you don't know me, I'm Chayaz. I've been fascinated by weird tales since I was a kid. I remember we always used to go on holiday to North Wales and I would save up my pocket money and I'd go round all of the weird and wonderful shops in places like Conwy and Clandidno and I would hunt down books about strange but true stories or weird happenings from around the world and I built up such a collection of them and I would read them from cover to cover over and over again. So when I say that this podcast has been a long time coming, I'm talking literally since I was seven years old. Something from back then must have really stuck with me because I still spend a huge amount of my free time watching documentaries about bizarre things that have happened, whether it was last week or a hundred years ago. I can't get enough of it. These episodes will feature everything from true crime and unsolved mysteries to astonishing coincidences and tales full of bizarre twists. In today's episode, I'm going to be telling you the unbelievable story of Ursula and Sabina Erickson. This is one of those cases where when someone says to me, Chayaz, what is the wildest story that you can think of? This one immediately comes to mind. There's also a really tragic twist to this story and a huge amount of very important lessons that can be learned from how this case was handled. This story does get rough, so please do prepare yourselves. But let's talk about one of the most fascinating cases of the condition, folie de, that has been documented in recent years. The reason I decided to tell this story in the first ever episode of Things Are About To Get Weird is because I was actually driving down the M6 motorway the other day. If you're not from the UK, the M6 is the longest motorway in the UK. So it's located totally within England. It goes from the Midlands to the border with Scotland. So it's just over 230 miles, which if you're in somewhere like the United States, that probably doesn't seem very long, but for the UK, it's super long. And this story just popped right back into my mind. And I was like, God, that is absolutely bizarre. So I'm going to take you back to Saturday the 17th of May 2008 around lunchtime at Keel service station on the M6 motorway. So if you're not from the UK, on our motorways every say 20 miles or so we have a service station and it's usually at a major junction. It might not be accurate for the entire motorway but that's roughly what they are and they're sort of buildings where you have, um, there might be a McDonald's, there might be a Burger King, a Costa Coffee within a building and then you're usually have your petrol pumps as well. So they're usually quite busy. I actually used to work at a service station on the M6 when I was a teenager, but I'm going to get a little bit more to that later in the story. So we're at Kiel service station. Identical 40-year-old Swedish twins Ursula and Sabina Eriksson were on a National Express coach heading from London to Liverpool and to this day it's still unclear why they visited England during this time. Sabina lived in Ireland and Ursula lived in the US. We do know that Ursula had been visiting Sabina in Ireland so I guess it's possible that they just popped over to England for a visit but Sabina's partner had said that the twins had become inseparable during this visit. Now, I do believe that twins have some strange connections going on. It's always really cool, I think, actually. I would love to have been a twin. But it was a comment that was made that they'd become inseparable. Interesting note for later. The National Express coach that they were travelling on had stopped at Kiel Services, and a police report later said that the twins were feeling unwell and they decided to disembark. One of the retail managers at the service station said that the driver of the coach had told her that the sisters were behaving suspiciously, that they wouldn't let him take their bags off them to go into the coach, I imagine in the the base of the coach where there's like a holding area for bags, and he wasn't willing to let them back on the coach. So at this time, the sisters are sort of wandering around the service station. 
Now, if you've ever been to a service station in the UK, you'll know that it's not very easy to sort of walk off. And there's not usually very many places to go. It's not as if there's like a residential road like right next to a service station. You're usually a little bit out of the way. So the retail manager actually started walking around to try and find the twins. And she found them quite quickly and said that they were carrying their bags very, very close to their chests. She said they were having a conversation about something which felt almost as if they were plotting something. So she definitely shared the coach driver's suspicion and she actually decided to ring the police. The police arrived and they managed to find the twins and have a conversation with them. And according to police, the women said they were going to find their way back to London and the police seemed satisfied that they'd done their bit. They left the twins a phone number to contact the coach company so they could get picked up on the next coach. And that seemed to be the end of the matter from where the police stood. I assume they didn't feel that the twins were a threat to themselves or others. That seemed to be the end of it. Unfortunately, it very much was only the beginning. Just to note, before I continue saying the twins' names over and over again, I'm almost certain that I'm pronouncing Ursula incorrectly for the Swedish pronunciation. So Sweden, please do forgive me. I'm sorry. The twins decided they were not going to wait for the next coach and they actually left on foot and headed towards the M6 motorway. Remember when I mentioned that I used to work at a service station on the M6? I was working at it during this time and I heard nothing about this story. This is honestly one of the first bizarre thing about it and the service station I was working at wasn't that far away from this one so really really odd. I didn't hear about this story until years and years later. I I don't know how I didn't. It's it's a complete it's one of the biggest mysteries about this to me to be honest still. So the twins are heading towards the M6 The next thing anyone knows, the twins are walking along the central reservation of the motorway. So they have traffic flowing in both directions, either side of them. I can't even fathom how they made it to the central reservation in the first place, knowing how busy the M6 can get. And this can all be seen on CCTV. So if you want to look it up, the CCTV is out there. And then things just get wilder. Sabina runs straight from the central reservation into the oncoming traffic and is quickly followed by Ursula doing the same thing. By sheer and complete coincidence, the two police officers who are called to the scene are involved in filming for the BBC One series Motorway Cops. So everything is being filmed. It's, it's really shocking to actually watch this footage. It's a, I think it's one of the main reasons why this case has stuck in my mind so clearly because when you see the actual footage of what the twins did. It's mind-boggling. So the two police officers have heard that these two women have run straight into oncoming traffic and they arrive at the scene expecting serious injuries. But though Sabina had been hit by a car, miraculously, both of the twins had only minor injuries. When the police arrive, there's a highway patrol car with the twins at the side of the road. So both of them are walking around, talking, one of them smoking. It's like nothing had happened. The thing that I always think about this moment is that even if they had miraculously not sustained any injuries from what they'd just done, the adrenaline would make you act slightly odd, but they just seemed quite normal. It was as though they'd been pulled over just walking down the street. Now, as the two police officers are being briefed by the highway patrol, they're being filmed by this camera crew who are there filming motorway cops. And in the background of this shot, we see Ursula break free and run into the path of an articulated lorry. And she was, she was crushed under its wheels. Sabina very quickly, once again, follows her and is hit by a car at a very high speed. It's incredibly distressing to watch. So if you do want to watch it, just be warned that it's just, it's it's horrific. It really is horrific. However, both miraculously once again survived. Ursula's legs had been crushed and she couldn't move and Sabina was unconscious for about 15 minutes. 
when Ursula was able to speak, she started talking to the police officer and she was saying, I recognise you, I know you're not real. And she was shouting, asking for the police and trying to move. Obviously, she was talking to the police, but she just didn't seem to realise that or she didn't seem to believe it. Sabina eventually did regain consciousness as well and she began shouting to her sister. She was saying, they're going to steal your organs. She then stood up. Mind you, she's been hit by a car. Let's not forget this. Obviously, her injuries were lesser than Ursula's, but she was still hit by a car on the motorway. And as she stood up, she wasn't sort of standing, struggling to get her balance, disorientated. She started punching the female police officer who was trying to help her. She then ran over the central reservation once more into oncoming traffic and to the other side of the road. Can you imagine the scenes? If you've ever driven on a motorway in the UK, you know that it's busy. You wouldn't want to even be stood at the side of the road with a broken down car, let alone running into traffic with the police chasing you, with flailing arms, punching police officers. It's just beyond. It's beyond. The male police officer begins to run over to her. He's stopping traffic. He's trying to calm Sabina, trying to speak to her. She's fighting him. There's two other police officers and then there's members of the public who are trying to help, trying to restrain her. The cars are stopped. It took six people to eventually restrain Sabina. The strength that she looked like she had in that moment is something that I think is superhuman. It's just, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it from just a human being on an average day, let alone someone who's just been hit by a car. As you can imagine, the police are hypothesizing, trying to work out what on earth is going on with these two twins. They're thinking, are they drunk? Are they on drugs? Do they have head injuries that are causing this behavior? Was it a pact for them to both take their own lives? They said that the twins were exhibiting very similar behaviour, almost strangely similar. Sabina was eventually sedated and both were taken to hospital. Ursula was actually taken to hospital by air ambulance because her injuries were just horrendous, as you can imagine. Sabina was given the all clear at the hospital and just five hours after the incident, in a police car on the way into custody, she seemed relatively relaxed. She wasn't wearing handcuffs when she got to the police station. She was chatting and joking with the officers. She seemed completely at ease. I still can't believe that she didn't require any major treatment after what she'd been through. And I also can't believe that she wasn't handcuffed because I just feel like she probably needed a huge amount more observation in every sense of the word. But Regardless, there's footage of her in the police station just chatting and joking with the police officers like it was just an average, average day. If you're partial to a little bit of foreshadowing, listen up. Sabina said some words that we now know are completely chilling. She said, we say in Sweden that an accident rarely comes alone. Usually at least one more follows, maybe two. At no point during her time at the police station does Sabina ask about her sister Ursula. She's far more concerned with the fact that she has to remove her jewellery. And considering that she had witnessed exactly what had happened to Ursula, it's even more strange that she didn't ask how she was at all. Sabina's asked if she'd ever tried to harm herself and she says no, despite what had happened just five hours earlier. She's actually charged with assaulting a police officer and trespass on a motorway. But interestingly, she had absolutely no prior criminal convictions. At this time, Ursula remained in hospital and while she was in hospital, she had tests and there were no traces of drugs or alcohol found in her system whatsoever. Ursula was actually not charged with any crimes and obviously she was gonna have to remain in hospital for some time. Police spoke to Sabina's partner in Ireland and her partner had no idea where she was or why she would be in England, her and Ursula, which is just another really odd detail to the story that they hadn't told anyone where they were going. On the 19th of May, Sabina was released from court after pleading guilty to her charges, but she left without a full psychiatric evaluation. I'm sorry, what qualifies a person to receive a full psychiatric evaluation if not running into oncoming traffic on the M6. I truly will never be able to understand why she didn't receive not only a full psychiatric evaluation, but why wasn't she 
kept in a safe place until such evaluation was done. It it truly baffles me. I will never understand it. And it is at this point in the episode that I wanted to make something really clear. Whilst this podcast is called Things Are About To Get Weird, it's certainly not the actual mental illness that the twins are suspected to have been suffering from that I'm calling weird. Folliada is fascinating, but weird is the wrong word to describe it. What is so weird about this case and what makes it this strange but true story is the way that it was handled. It is the fact that it was being filmed, the fact that the two police officers who were called to the M6 were the ones who were being filmed by motorway cops. I feel like as a society, the way that we talk about mental health has come a long way even since this incident occurred. As you can imagine, a lot of the coverage of this case from the time left a lot to be desired in the sense of understanding of the mental health condition. So just something to bear in mind. I wish that I could round off this story here and tell you that nothing else bad happened. Unfortunately, I can't do that. Things are gonna get a little bit rough. After leaving court, Sabina wandered the streets of Stoke-on-Trent, which is round Keel Services, trying to work out where Ursula was being treated. There was two local men, Glenn Hollinshead, who was a self-employed welder, a qualified paramedic and a former RAF airman, and his friend Peter Molly, and they were walking nearby after drinking together at a pub and they spotted Sabina walking along the street. Peter says that Sabina stuck out like a sore thumb. She was wearing a bubble jacket and she had her belongings in a clear plastic bag. And if you're from the UK, you know that if someone has their belongings in a clear plastic bag walking down the street, it's usually because they've just been released from police custody. She seemed lost and distressed, but she shouted across the road to the men that she liked the dog that they were walking. And that really sparked up this conversation between the three of them. Sabina explained that she was trying to find her sister and needed a bed and breakfast. She needed somewhere to stay. Peter says that Glenn offered Sabina a place to stay, some food and help finding her sister. If you've never been to Stoke-on-Trent, people from Stoke are lovely. So I can totally picture how this went down. They're, they're very accommodating. I've never met a Stokey who wasn't super helpful. So this makes complete sense to me. And it really just adds to the tragic nature of, of what was to come next. Peter said that Sabina became really bubbly and friendly on the walk over to Glenn's house. When they got there, the three of them had a drink together, they smoked some cigarettes, and Peter then asked questions, but Sabina went really cold when asked about Ursula or why she was in Stoke-on-Trent. In the quiet moments between when they were having their drinks and smoking, she seemed paranoid. She was peeking out of the curtains, which would obviously draw a little bit of suspicion in a lot of people. At one point, Sabina offered the two men cigarettes and as they were both about to light them, she furiously snatched them out of their mouths saying, they might be poisoned, you can't have these. Peter knew that something wasn't quite right. He said he had a growing fear inside of him, but Glenn was relaxed. He thought Sabina was quirky, but Peter, he really wanted to get out. Lunchtime the next day rolls around and Sabina is still at Glenn's house and Glenn is just being super helpful. He's ringing his brother who works at the local hospital to inquire about Ursula. He wants to help Sabina track her sister down and Glenn's brother could actually hear Sabina's voice in the background of this phone call so he knew that Sabina had been in Glenn's home that morning. As this is happening, Glenn's neighbour is washing his minibus outside on his driveway He had no idea he was about to be the last person to see Glenn alive. Glenn had gone outside to ask his neighbour for some tea bags before heading back into his house. Just a moment later, he stumbled back outside into the alleyway and says, she stabbed me. The neighbour recalls how he said, I'm dying, I'm dying. This is gutting, but his final words were, look after my dog. He thought he was just going to go to the hospital, but unfortunately he would never make it that far. Shortly after, Sabina is seen running from Glenn's house. She's spotted by a local man called Joshua Grattage and he's driving along the road and he spots Sabina immediately because she's hitting herself in the head with a hammer. He immediately stops the car, which is incredibly brave. I I can't even imagine. He runs to Sabina and he grabs the hammer to try and stop her from hurting herself further. They struggled before Sabina took a roof tile from her pocket and struck him on the back of the head. 
The last thing that he saw was her run across the roundabout, followed by two paramedics. Thankfully, Joshua did survive, but I can't even imagine how traumatic that must have been. He was so brave to stop in the first place, I don't think many people would have. Sabina ran onto a bridge 40 feet above the A50 road, which is smaller than a motorway, but it's still a very busy main road. And she jumps off the bridge. I told you it was going to be rough, guys, but Sabina actually survived. She broke both of her ankles and fractured her skull, but she is taken to hospital. When there, Sabina is charged with murder. Glenn Holland's head had been stabbed five times with a kitchen knife. It's just, it's just devastating. I mean, this poor guy was trying to help. It's, it's so sad. So many people were failed during the course of this story for so many different reasons. It's, it's just, it's completely tragic. During all this, Ursula is still in the hospital. She was actually there for three months until she was discharged. And as I said, she was, she was never charged with, with anything. She was discharged. She relocated back to Sweden and eventually to the US. Okay, let's breathe and talk about what on earth happened. As you can imagine, there are many conspiracy theories, which I think stem from the things that the sisters were shouting, saying about they're going to steal your organs and you're not real. But I don't know about you, the past few years have totally changed my view on conspiracy theories and I kind of entertain them a lot less than I used to. We're going to talk about what the official defence was because I feel that once you hear it, it does start to make a lot of sense. So in court, Sabina pleaded guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility and that was on the 2nd of September 2009. She chose to say no comment to every single question that was asked of her and she's never offered an explanation as to why she carried out any of her actions during those days. Both the prosecution and defence claim that Sabina was insane at the time of Glenn Hollinshead's murder, although she had become sane again by the time of her trial. The defence that was used was folle a deux. Now, if you're an elder emo like me, you may have heard that term before because it's the title of a Fall Out Boy album. And the definition of it is a delusion or mental illness shared by two people in close association. So the defence counsel said that Sabina was a secondary sufferer of folie de, influenced by the presence or perceived presence of Ursula, the primary sufferer. The court also heard that she had suffered from a rare psychiatric disorder which made her hear voices but could not interpret what they said, as well as an alternative theory that she had suffered from an acute polymorphic delusional disorder. Her plea was accepted by Justice Saunders, who concluded that Sabina had a low level of culpability for her actions, and she was sentenced to five years in prison. Sabina was released on parole in 2011 before returning to Sweden. I want to talk a little bit more about folie I think because it's such an incredibly rare condition, it's kind of difficult to get your head around, so let's go into it a little bit deeper. Folie de translates to folly of two or madness shared by two, and it's also known as shared psychosis or shared delusional disorder. I found a really interesting article from the National Library of Medicine that talks about folie de. So the term folie de actually encompasses several syndromes in which psychological symptoms, particularly paranoid delusions, are transmitted from one person to another person or one person to a group of people. And it's usually with people who the instigator has some kind of intimate association with. And that association is so that these shared delusional ideas can actually be, if you like, transmitted from one person to another. So with Ursula and Sabina being twins, this does make sense. And we know that Ursula had been visiting Sabina in Ireland, presumably staying with her in close quarters. So it would kind of make sense how this could perhaps have taken hold of the twins. There are cases of folie that have been documented that actually involve entire families. And from what I've read, please do correct me if I'm wrong, any psychologist listening, it does seem that it's quite common that when a case of folie de does occur, it is within a family unit. There's cases of mothers and sons, siblings, as I said, entire families. It really is one of the most fascinating areas of psychology that I've ever come across. 
The article states that Folida is perhaps one of the most impressive examples of a pathological relationship. If you listen to or watch a lot of true crime content and you're thinking to yourself that this kind of condition involving two sisters seems a little bit familiar, you may be thinking of the case of Christine and Leia Papin. Christine and Leia were two French sisters who were born in the early 1900s. They worked as maids for a very wealthy family and they were actually convicted of murdering two members of the family they worked for. This happened on the evening of Thursday, February the 2nd, 1933. The sisters brutally murdered Leonie Lancelin and her daughter Genevieve. At their trial, the sisters' lawyer actually pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity on behalf of the pair. At the time, with it being 1933, there was a huge debate within the psychological community about exactly which condition the sisters may have been suffering with. Eventually, after a huge amount of consideration, it was determined that Christine and Leia were suffering from shared paranoid disorder. And there was a lot of talk about the fact that within this disorder, it's often the case that one of the people involved dominates or overshadows the other. Now, this potentially has an interesting parallel with the case that we're talking about on this episode, because Ursula was determined to be the primary sufferer of Folida, with Sabina being the secondary. And in this case, it was determined that Leia was being overshadowed and her whole personality was being dominated by Christine. The reason I say it's a potential parallel is because even though it was reported that Ursula was the primary sufferer, Sabina was the secondary, we haven't had a huge amount of information that actually talks about the twins' relationship before this incident. We don't really know whether Ursula's personality was more dominant over Sabina's, we just don't have that information. Now, something about this case that will always have a little bit of a question mark hanging over it for me from a psychological perspective is this. It's about the fact that when Sabina committed the murder of Glenn Hollinshead, she was alone. Ursula wasn't with her. Now, I know before I mentioned about when Folliada is about having the presence or perceived presence of the other person who is within the condition, but I'm not sure whether from what we know about the fact that Sabina was trying to get Glenn's help with finding Ursula, she knew Ursula wasn't with her, so it doesn't seem like she did have that perceived presence of her sister being with her. And I just wonder from a psychological perspective how the Folliada was able to still take hold once the sisters were physically separated and Sabina didn't think Ursula was with her. So I don't know, it's just one of those things that's always been a little bit confusing to me, just from a pure psychological perspective. It makes me wonder how many valuable insights into this condition could have been learned if Ursula and Sabina had had those full psychological evaluations after the incident on the M6. I don't think anybody could ever look at Ursula and Sabina's actions on the M6 and think, oh yeah, they're just having a bad day. There was so clearly a huge issue going on that was so much more than just a surface problem, maybe that they were just having a bad time in their lives. No, this was obviously, I'll just never be able to understand why they weren't properly assessed or at least Sabina wasn't properly assessed before she was released from custody. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Of course, the case raised huge questions around the treatment and handling of the matter with regards to the twins' mental health. I wanted to end this episode with a quote from Glenn's brother, Gary, who I can't even imagine what he's been through, especially the fact that he talked to his brother just before this happened. It's just terrible. So here is what Gary said about Sabina. We don't hold her responsible, the same as we wouldn't blame a rabid dog for biting someone. She is ill and to a large degree not responsible for her actions, but her mental disorder should have been recognised much earlier. I do question the criminal justice system for allowing someone like this to be let out when she is capable of committing such a crime. Her mental condition should have been properly assessed after what she did on the motorway and the experiences the police had. Her mental disorder should have been picked up prior to her being let out into the community. Glenn saw Erickson in distress and he was just trying to help. He wasn't slow in coming forward to help somebody in distress. It was in his nature. He was trying to help. He would help anybody. If he saw a fight in the street and a guy was losing, he would help. I'm sorry to end this podcast on such a sad note, but it really is just a incredibly frustrating failure of the system. And yes, whilst this is an app, 
absolutely wild story and when you watch the CCTV and you watch the uh, motorway cops episode and you see all the footage you're like whoa the twists and turns but I think as with any true crime story it's really important to remember that there are real victims and that quote from Gary just it really hits it all home. Thank you so much for listening to the first ever episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. I will be putting some mental health resources in the show notes as well as further information about Folly Adir. Dirt. I think with these kind of stories, rather than just consuming it and going, oh, that was really strange, which obviously it's an absolutely wild, bizarre story, but there are real victims at the end of it and there are things to be learned as well. So I will put all of that information in the show notes. I mentioned a couple as we went along, but I just wanted to give a shout out to the sources which helped with my research for this episode. The BBC documentary Madness in the Fast Lane, which I assume was put together using footage that was recorded initially for the Motorway Cops episode, but was obviously far more than the filmmakers bargained for on that day. I also found a lot of information on Wikipedia, as well as that article from the National Library of Medicine. I would love to know what you think about this story. Do you believe that it's a cut and dry case of the very rare condition folie adieu, Or do you think there is more credit to be given to some of the conspiracy theories? Let's carry on the conversation online. So I've created separate Instagram and Twitter accounts for this podcast. So on Instagram, it's at things get weird podcast. And Twitter is a shorter handle. It's at about to get weird. Twitter have some character limits with things. So we've had to do something a little bit different for both of those but you can also use the hashtag things are about to get weird I can't wait to hear what you think about this I think it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag to be honest although I'm firmly in the folie de camp I really am if you've enjoyed this episode please do work your magic and leave us a rating and review on apple podcasts it really does help especially when starting a podcast from scratch Episodes two and three of Things Are About To Get Weird are also up, so if you enjoyed this episode, please do feel free to head over and listen to those two as well, and there will be a new episode every Wednesday. If you know a strange but true story that you've always found fascinating and that you would like to hear featured on this podcast, please do get in touch with me. You can send me an email at thingsgetweirdpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, take care of yourself and others and keep it weird, but the good kind of weird. Weird.